Hey YouTube, it's Demetri, and today we're going to answer a very interesting question, um, something I could go on very deeply, but I'm going to try to cover this as succinctly and short as possible. Um, Brian asks, uh, do you trust math more than your financial intuition? Do they always complement each other? I personally think they do not always complement each other, and sometimes something illogical or hidden improves your in-sample and out-of-sample fit irrationally. I'm going to pretend you said in time and out of time because we're in finance space. Um, but anyways, I, I am not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying, would you allow something irrational, zero assumptions to be part of your model? I feel like we as humans try to justify everything, but those assumptions sometimes do not hold in reality. We are just justifying our model. However, I am just a junior, so I'd like to hear from experienced professionals. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Dimitri Bianco. So there's... There's two parts to this, and I think it's critical to understand two parts of this. And it has taken me a long time in a career to really understand uh, these issues. So let's just break this down. I'm going to get the drawing board out here because I think this is the best way for me to explain it. And I'll give you some real world examples, maybe one, maybe two on here. All right, so we're going to have something I'm just going to call unknown, right? There's something unknown that seems to make the model better. And what do we do? What do we, I mean, can we justify it? Can we not justify it? There's going to be two parts to this. There's going to be politics, unfortunately, and then there's also going to be technical. Now, let me break this down and see if we can fit this on one page here. Um, but politically, there's, there's an issue here. So first off, every model is typically built for someone else. Unfortunately, um, it is very rare to build a model that you solely use um, that is the outcome is 100% based on you. Like, it's not like I'm building, trading, and operating myself. Um, typically, you know, you're building a model for someone else to use here. So the politics of this is going to be um, how hard is it to sell? So this is a critical aspect here. Imagine you have a model, and I'll give you an example with this. I had a model, and... I believe the model was correct. I believe there was intricate pieces within the model here. Um, but imagine there are parts to this model that are harder to explain. Um, or in the case of the question being asked that you just cannot explain here, right? And you're using the model to solve some sort of problem. So, I mean, I'm guessing the individual is talking about pricing or trading. That's what everyone seems to talk about. Um, but I'm on the pricing side of like loans and assets and, you know, other sorts of things. Um, but imagine you're trying to price something and you have pieces that are going to be in the model itself. If you don't understand them at all, how do you sell that to the end user? Now, when I do this and I'm trying to sell this to a user, it's typically pricing and strategy teams, it's executive teams. It's, you know, this model is magical, it's wonderful, it's going to work, it's going to solve all of your problems. Um, and this is exactly how, and this is the relationship. If I cannot explain part of that, then often it turns into this long drawn out argument and fight and debate. And then what ends up happening is often you can't just remove the unknown part and say, hey, accuracy went from 80% to AUC down to 77. It's fine. It's close enough. Then people start to get really nervous and they lose faith and they lose trust in you as a developer. So you lose a portion of your ability in the eyes of everybody else. This reduces your promotions. Again, this increased the massive amount of stress for you. And at the end of the day, does it really matter, right? This is interestingly a political issue here. Now, the businesses, the users of the models are gonna say like, oh, do or die, we want maximum accuracy. They really don't. They really want to understand that. Now, that's part of that. If you look at this from an investment standpoint, um, imagine this as a financial advisor or a corporation that's doing wealth management or managing someone else's assets, a hedge fund or some sorts. Um, when you're doing this, you have to explain often, not exactly all the details and the workings and everything, but imagine you build a model and it's a portfolio optimization model to select assets and you use this methodology and it has something that just seems ridiculous, right? Like you, it's something, as you mentioned, we don't know why, it just makes it better. And so you just use it. Well, your risk management hat should go on at this point and think like, what happens when this blows up? It's not if it's going to blow up. Eventually, you're going to have issues. You're going to have to rebalance the portfolio. Uh, I mean, hedge funds don't like to admit this, but there are catastrophes every three, five years, depending on size and design and function. And firms that have a lot of risk management don't blow up because they have a lot of pieces and movements in this. But imagine trying to explain this to a client. Like, hey, we had a model... Um, the markets went sideways and we lost 70, 80% of all the investments in there. 
And then they, they're going to grill you and say, but how and why, right? And you're going to go, well, I, I don't really know. There was this one variable that was in there or this one structure, this one piece, this design that we had. We didn't really understand it, but we used it anyways and increased accuracy and it looked good in testing and out, you know, out of time testing and everything. Um, how would you explain that? Right. That's the political side of this that you have to think about, which is unfortunately a challenging piece here. Now, everybody says they want the world's best and brightest cutting edge quants and they want you to do the right thing. Politically, the reality is they don't. Um, it's much easier as a quant to build generic models, sell them, convince people to use them, get pretty good results and move on with your day. Get some promotions, shake some hands, kiss some babies. Um, that's the reality of this. Nobody wants to admit it, but that's the political side of that here. So again, being able to explain it is going to have a lot of benefits here. And I would argue in most cases, you're actually better off taking a worse performing model than taking something that you believe is the best. You don't really understand it, but you think it's the best. Um, in finance, typically it's best to be a little bit conservative and choose something that's not uh, going to blow up a position or a firm or whatever. And even when you have something that's just fine tuning a model and it's just giving you that, that beautiful, uh, you know, a little bit of extra and there's a bunch of great things that come out of it. Um, there's a piece to this. The other piece to this I'm going to talk about here on the technical side is what do you do when you don't understand something? Right. So technically, when you have a model, you have something designed, you don't understand it. What should you do? Um, what you should do is you should do research. That's what you should do. Um, because this is a great opportunity for you. One, as a develop model developer, you might learn something interesting, unique, and different. Two, I would encourage you, go talk to the business, the person that wants you to build the model. Um, the reason for this is often you might build something and think this makes no sense. It's you know ridiculous. Um, and it seems completely made up. And what you're going to end up finding out is the business actually might have some sort of insight or information on why it works. The other piece of this is you might end up discovering or finding something you just don't know here. So you might learn something new. I would argue technically, meaning the pure quants, those that just love the, the field in itself. These are the, the problems we dream of. We dream of something that looks magical, that works amazing, and we want to spend the time to go and figure out what is technically there? Is it statistically significant? Why is it statistically significant? Is the model design unique? Like what is going on here? You should be diving deep into this here. Um, so technically speaking, right, you, you need to go look and figure it out. If you cannot figure it out on a technical stance, I would actually argue you probably should not use it as well. Um, the reason for this is everybody talks about model accuracy, model accuracy, model accuracy. And I've said in other videos, I don't care about model accuracy. It's like a third, fourth, fifth priority. It's not that critical. People are like, what? How dare you say that? Um, no, model robustness is probably the, is my number one metric of quality models, model development. It's how I actually grade and look at employees as well that build models for me. Um, how robust are your models? That is what I care about. So robustness is I view this in kind of two things. Yes, you can say statistically and pull out, you know, statistical definitions and all that. I'm using robustness as a general term. Robustness is going to be that the model itself um, lasts and has good stability across time. Okay, so it's going to last for some extended period of time. It's a good value model in that sense. Two, it's going to not blow up when it goes wrong, when something's wrong in it. So you can actually design in slow failures more or less looking at different characteristics within data and variable and relationships and model design and a bunch of other features within the design work. We're actually financial engineers. We are engineering financial products when we build a model, for example, for pricing, um, and we're actually designing it. When it's going to fail, I monitor these pieces. I want it to fail slowly to the point that I can design and build and get all these pieces kind of put together and fixed. So that is another piece of that. Um, as a quant, like it seems ridiculous from a int intellectual stance of like, if something just magically works, why would you use it? Right? Like I need to know. And sometimes you're never going to know. And so this is going to bring these two parts together, which is, you know, should you research it? Right? Um, and I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to say put a time limit on it because um, as much as you want to know, the reality is you're being paid by someone to build that model. And often you might be chasing a solution to something that doesn't have critical impact. So again, here, depending how much, you know, bang for the buck you're getting out of here, how much accuracy, how much robustness from the model you're getting out, um, you know, how much time should you spend on this? And I'm going to go back to the politics side of this, unfortunately, which is going to be, 
Um, the politics side usually don't care. They just want you to build something good and quality and they want you to sell them on it. And they want you to tell them you're bought in and you're hundred percent. The reality is quants are never a hundred percent in the models they build, at least not good quants. Um, you should be looking at this and you should be researching it, but also there is the political side of this of, do you spend a lot of time researching, researching it or not? Two, on the technical side of this as well, you might have better things to be doing with your time on the research space here, right? So again, looking at this, why does this nonsensical variable working in the model? Or why does this new model design or structure work? It's in violation of, I don't know, some statistical test, for example, but now it works amazing. Um, again, you should look at the research side, spend the time, be a quant, be curious, figure it out. Um, but the reality is you're going to have limitations. Set a time limit. Spend the time. If you're not making good progress, things aren't getting done. Um, I'm going to tell you guys the secret. Just drop it. Use the less you know, fancy model. Um, and unfortunately, when the business asks, you tell them it's a great and it's a wonderful model and you think this is you know stellar and this is the best thing that's out there. Um, in the back of your mind, yes, it will bug you and it will irritate you. There might be something better. Um, but there's an explainability piece with this. And that's where I think this video's conclusion is of, do you use something that you don't understand in a model? No. Um, there's often a risk reward trade-off. You're going to have to make the decision. It's not always going to be no, but I would say 99% of the time, the answer is no. You should never use it in the model here. Um, the reason for this, again, is because there is a user on the other end of it that might not understand that. And I will tell you, management does not want to get down in the nitty-gritty details to understand that. Um, so typically, it's best not to do that. Now, to give you guys a quick example here, I had a model structure and design I won't give too many details on it. Um, there was a variable where the, the data itself, so draw this out, uh, it looked like this, and the Y variable is here, the X variable is here that we're gonna be putting in the model. Uh, it was multivariable model, right? A long, built-out, dynamic, structured model here. Um, and so you can see, right, the relationship should be this. Um, the coefficient in the model should have been um, positive, in this case, um, in this example I'm making up. Uh, there are lots of details in this, but uh, it should have been this. Anyways, and when we ended up running the regression, it ended up being the opposite. So actually, when we ran the regression, it pulled a per perpendicular and the sign was negative. And when you plotted it, you could see this and everyone's like, you know, you've got to drop it. And, you know, I was like, yeah, let's drop it. Let's just do that. Uh, the quant in me, though, is crying um, because the reality is, is there were dynamics being played into this model here. There were a lot of variables in this model, um, but there were an, there was another variable that was similar to this one. So we'll say this is X variable that I talked about. We'll say this is a short term um, variable. And we're going to say this is X2 and X2 was a long term version of this variable. Um, and what we ended up doing with this is that X, the long term variable had the proper sign. So the proper coefficient. Uh, and the short one, not proper. What was in what I can tell you what's happening here, but it's very hard to explain. At least it's hard for me to explain on the business side of why this is occurring. What ends up happening is essentially when you set out some sort of regression, let's just pretend it's linear for the time being. Uh, beta one, X one, say so this is X one, beta two, X two plus yada, yada, yada. Let's just say there's like another 30 variables in the model here. It's estimating the entire space to predict Y, but it's taking into all these different dynamics here. I knew that X2 and X1 were interacting. And what ends up happening is the beta coefficient for beta 2 here, this gets overestimated. And there's actually a dynamic adjustment to this based on the uniqueness of the thing that we were modeling here in such that this then was essentially a negative and it was redu reducing the relationship within itself here. So imagine you have long-term dynamics, short-term dynamics, long-term dynamics say one thing, short-term dynamics show that the market is shifting or changing. There's some sort of dynamical you know, feature change in design here. Um, but every observation isn't the same. Like just because the long-term value is here, it doesn't mean the short-term is going to be here. You might have one with the long-term here and a short-term here and then one with the long-term here and a short-term here. And like the dynamics are crazy and different. Um, this was capturing it in the model and it's exciting. And I get really into this, 
but I realized in my head, this is too complicated now to go back to explain. And I took a quick shot at this in a meeting and then there was some debate and like nobody wanted to do it. You know, the industry does it this way. This is how we're going to do it. And so I looked at it and I looked in the model and there was a bunch of other variables as well that had this odd um, dynamics here. And I thought to myself, do I want to spend another two to three months of me personally going back? Because I didn't build the model, an employee built it. But did I want to go back and dig in and justify all the dynamics and how the relationships are working and why the model was working? Um, and I could have made this a very complex known structure and design, um, but we were squeezing out a few little points of accuracy for this. And then we're going to spend a few times. I'm behind on schedule on this model as it is. Um, I'm already having a lot of frictions, again, politically here. So the politics plays a key part in being a quant. And so I think to myself, uh, do I want to fight this? Do I want to die on this hill, right? Do I really want to push this home? Or should we just make a bunch of fix qu or quick fixes here? Um, wash my hands of it, walk away. Everybody's happy. We've reduced the amount of risk, right? We've suffered a little bit of accuracy loss. But we're not going to have issues with it. Um, Again, right, that robust trade-off here. Do we want really robust models? Do we want accuracy models? I know, I know, as a quant deep down, it's it's like it's it's pulling out your heart um, because you know there are interesting dynamics in there, but explaining these dynamics to model users and getting 5, 10, 15 people on board with this is very, very frustrating, um, especially as a quant. It's a hard thing to do here. So, again... I'm not going to use variables I don't understand, structures, designs. I will research them. And I mean, you guys know I run this YouTube channel as well. Often I'm buying a bunch of textbooks and I'm reading things. And I'm, you know, in my head, these things have stuck with me throughout a career. Some of them, they've bugged me so much. I've gone down and researched and tried to find the solutions, even without the data. I'm just trying to theoretically understand that. So anyways, do not use variables and dynamics and parts you don't understand. I'm um, sure there are maybe some rare cases where you could do it. Maybe if it's your, you know, your decision and you're the one willing to take that risk or accept that risk. But there's going to be some considerations of weighing on how, you know, the model performs versus the risks you want to take. Um, in general, understanding the model is absolutely critical in the finance industry. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Thanks.